I'm ready. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today we're going to be picking up in Acts chapter 7. We will be looking at verses 9 through 16. Before we begin our study, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can gather together this evening, this morning. We thank you for the present freedoms that we enjoy, for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, that we can be good stewards of that which you have blessed us with, um, not only this facility, but, uh, but our health and the time that you give to us. And Father, we just pray that uh, as we take this time to look into your word, that this will be a time of fruitful understanding. We pray that we will be sensitive to the illuminating ministry of the Holy Spirit who helps us to understand the biblical text. We pray that we will be challenged by these things, Lord, that we might grow thereby. Father, we thank you this morning. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I will be using the New American Standard Bible. The 1995 update is the version that I generally use. Occasionally, I'll use another translation like the Holman Christian Standard or the ESV or the Net Bible. It just depends on if I feel like something else will bring some clarification. But the NASB is what we'll be uh, going through this morning. Now, just to kind of back up and give some introduction to this, and Leon did a really good job last week, and I'm going to back up and kind of give a, a bigger view, um, kind of give us the 30,000-foot view of uh, the book of Acts, and then we'll look at the smaller section. We'll look at a, a few trees uh, in this particular section, and then we'll take some fruit off the trees for ourselves to consume at the end of the lesson. Now, in the previous section, that is in Acts 7, 1 through 8, Stephen presented the first part of his message, which demonstrated God's work in history through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who fathered the 12 patriarchs. Stephen started out his presentation um, giving a defense, we might say, might be one way to put it, not so much of himself as much as it was a defense of what God uh, has done in history and is doing in history because it was a charge that was leveled against him uh, by the leadership uh, that he was trying to do away with the law of Moses. It was an attack upon the law of Moses and upon the temple. And so Jesus is going to, excuse me, Stephen is going to address some of these things. But you'll notice that he closes out there in verse 8 where he talks about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the 12 patriarchs. And by the way, when you look at Stephen's message, it's a little tricky to follow. Kind of like my message today will be. It'll be a little tricky to follow, but just... Just bear with me. We'll get there. Remember, follow the bouncing ball? Remember that? I'm dating myself? Okay. Uh, but Stephen skips periods of time. He'll, between one verse and the next, he'll jump several hundred years. And so you have to, you have to kind of follow through and, and pay close attention. So Stephen has brought us up to this point talking about the 12 patriarchs, but he, he's going to pause and he's going to talk about Joseph. And once he gets through talking about Joseph, he's then going to talk about Moses. And after Moses, he's going to talk about the tabernacle and the temple, and he's going to mention David and Solomon. And then he's going to eventually come to the point where he's going to get to Jesus, which is really kind of at the heart of his message. So in the following sections, uh, Stephen is showing God's work through Joseph, through Moses, and that he will, and that he ultimately, uh, and that God ultimately does not dwell in human structures such as the tabernacle and temple. And, of course, the final part of Stephen's message was intended to show God's work in Jesus, the righteous one who was betrayed and killed by the Jewish leadership. That final point there is where Stephen's getting to his message. And uh, remember that they had him on trial, but by the time we get through with this message, Stephen turns it all around. And they are the ones that are on trial, and he is the one who is acting as, in effect, a judge pronouncing judgment upon them. And he says to them, he says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. And which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. And of course, their response to this is just going to be absolute hostility and they're going to begin screaming they're going to become they're going to start shouting they're going to put their hands over their ears they're not going to want to hear any more of what he has to say and they're going to charge him they're going to rush him and we know how it's going to result it's going to result in his being stoned to death and so that kind of gives us the big picture of where we're going now in this current section that i'm looking at this morning we're just going to look at this particular pericope this unit of thought this paragraph 
So in the current section, Stephen briefly explains how the patriarchs rejected and mistreated Joseph. And by the way, he's going to show uh, a pattern here. And again, you kind of have to follow the thought of what he's doing. So he's going to show how the patriarchs rejected and mistreated Joseph. However, the one that they had rejected was the one whom God had chosen to be their deliverer. And that's the divine irony of it, because they, they, they lied about Joseph. They betrayed Joseph. They wanted to kill him, remember, and they sold him into captivity. And he goes down into Egypt, and he's purchased uh, by Potiphar. And then we know how that situation turns out with Potiphar's uh, lying wife, who accuses him of something that was not true. And then Joseph winds up in graduate school, I mean, in prison for a couple years, <laughs> as, Lord seeks, as the Lord seeks to develop his character, and then finally brings him out. But Joseph winds up being the one who winds up being the deliverer, we might even say the savior of his brothers, of his family. And this is all by divine, God's divine providence. And so he winds up being their deliverer. And though they had rejected Joseph the first time, they welcomed him the second time. And we're going to see that pattern. We're going to see that pattern in Joseph. We're going to see that pattern in Moses where he's rejected and then accepted. And by the way, guess where it's going to lead us? We're going to see that pattern with Jesus as well. Because he's rejected the first time, but he will be accepted at his second coming. And so again, we see where Stephen repeated this narrative with Moses, who Israel rejected the first time, but welcomed the second time. And again, the final part of Stephen's message will point out that his generation was guilty of rejecting and murdering Jesus, the righteous one whom God had chosen to be their deliverer. And again, biblically, we know Jesus was rejected at his first coming, but will be accepted at his second coming. So you see the pattern here, and there, there's, there seems to be, we might even say, uh, a bit of eschatological certainty uh, about the pattern here and how it will culminate in Christ and his second coming. Now, Stephen opens this pericope, and remember that a pericope is just a unit of thought. Uh, we're talking about a paragraph here. So he opens this pericope with a brief overview of the Joseph narrative. And by the way, he assumes that his audience knows the, the, the biblical uh, uh, record here. And so he talks about the, how the patriarchs became je uh, jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt, yet God was with him. And the section that Stephen is going to be referencing, if you go back and you look at it in Genesis, is Genesis chapters 37 through 50. So he's covering a large section of, uh, of scripture here. Now, though the Jewish leaders would not make the connection until later, if they made the connection at all, really, Stephen was comparing them with 10 of Joseph's brothers who had become jealous and sold him into slavery. Likewise, it was because of a similar mental attitude of sin toward uh, uh, by the Jewish leadership that they had mistreated Jesus. And remember that Matthew records in Matthew 27, 18, that it was because of envy that they handed him over to Pilate to be crucified. And, th and that's a nasty mental attitude. And to think about this is what motivated them, at least in part. Of course, in some ways, they were pawns being used by spiritual forces in the background as uh, we know that Satan and certainly demonic forces were at work in this situation as well. And I think here with Stephen. Though Stephen was mistreated by, excuse me, though Joseph was mistreated by 10 of his brothers, we are told that God was with him. Now, because God was with Joseph in Acts 7.10, uh, Luke tells us that he rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. So what has happened here is, is you get where Joseph, when he's sold into captivity, is roughly about 17 years of age. And then jumping forward to the time of his being elevated to the right-hand position of Pharaoh would have put him at about 30. So again, we're seeing skips in time here. Now, historically, we know that God rescued Joseph, but only after allowing Joseph to suffer unjust persecution for a time. Joseph suffered at the hands of his brothers. He suffered at the hands of Potiphar's lying wife and then was placed in prison for two years. And though Joseph suffered at the hands of, of wicked people, God used their sinful choices to bring about a greater good. Similarly, God worked through wicked leaders, both Jews and Gentiles, to bring about the death of Christ and our salvation. This is the sovereignty of God. This is the providence of God that the wicked actions of people does not thwart his greater purposes. We think of in Acts 2, 24 to 26, which says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. 
this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And in that one verse, we see the coalescence of divine and human will at the cross. Mankind doing his worst and God demonstrating his sovereign control through that situation to bring about our salvation through the cross. That's the brilliance of God. That's the sovereignty of God. And, uh, and that's just staggering to think about. And then, of course, he says in verse 24, but God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. We think of a parallel passage in uh, Acts 4, 26 through 28, which says the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So here again, we see the human effort. For truly in the city there were gathered together against your holy servant, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So again, we see this, this coalescence of divine and human will working at, uh, together at a point in time to bring about the crucifixion of Christ and ultimately to affect our salvation. And if we see a glimpse of that in the, in the Joseph narrative as well. So throughout Joseph's time in Egypt, God was with him and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, God has a way of directing his people to meet others. And we should realize that there are no accidental encounters in this life, but that God directs our lives in such a way that everyone we meet is part of his sovereign plan. And we should realize that. We should realize that God works in the details of life. We live in an open universe where God lives and not lives, but he is present and he is active. And that is clearly the record of scripture, that God is very active in the lives of his people, most notably uh, uh, through the uh, person of Christ coming into the world, through the righteous life that he lived and through his substitutionary atoning death. But when we think about people that we meet, we should realize that there are no accidental encounters, that this is all part of God's sovereign plan. Now, the possession of wisdom in God's servants is an indication of his favor toward them. And God, who had granted Joseph wisdom and favor in the sight of Pharaoh, made Joseph governor over Egypt and all his household. You see, God was in charge of Joseph's advancement. And this is true of all believers. For example, we see in Hannah's prayer, which is a, <laughs> I love her prayer. I mean, you want to talk about theologically rich. I mean, it is just, there's so much in, in there that's so insightful. But part of the prayer, she says, the Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and to inherit a seat of honor. And Peter's instructions to believers is humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. And so it means that we must be, uh, maintain faithfulness to the Lord, to our walk with him, that we don't have to seek to advance ourselves in situations, that the Lord will create those scenarios, those circumstances, whereby he will advance us in his time and in his way. Now, while God was advancing Joseph in Egypt, he was also controlling the regional weather that would result in a drought and famine over the land. Prior to the famine, God had given Pharaoh two dreams. Remember about the fat cows and the skinny cows and the corn and they ate each other? But God had given Pharaoh two dreams that revealed he would cause seven years of prosperity to come and then he would bring seven years of drought and famine upon the land. From Genesis to Revelation, we see where God governs the lives of people and nations. Human rulers exist because of his plan. Um, Daniel 2.21 tells us that it is he who changes the times and the seasons, and that he removes kings and establishes kings, and he gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. And Joseph told Pharaoh, and I, I love this because it's operating from the divine viewpoint and not merely the human viewpoint. The human viewpoint is very myopic. It's very narrow. It's very limited. But this is one of the things that is so great about having a relationship with the Lord and about having his word is that it gives us insights into realities that we could never know, except that he, that he has spoken. 
And what he has spoken has been inscripturated. It's been written down for our benefit. And so it tells us about the infinite personal creator, God. It tells us about the origin of the universe. It tells us about the origin of people. It tells us about uh, the beginning of sin and why we live in a fallen world. It tells us about angels and demons that live in this invisible realm. It tells us about the Son of God coming into the world and taking upon himself humanity and affecting our salvation at the cross. It talks about the ascension of Christ. It talks about the future of mankind. It talks about the tribulation and the millennial reign. It describes for us the second coming of Christ. It gives us a reference point for history, not just past and present, but the future. And it gives us hope because we know that God is in sovereign control of his creation and we know that Christ is coming back. And so we have a future, we have a hope, and we operate personally as believers with a, with a personal sense of destiny that is rooted in our relationship with God. And this helps to govern our lives, to frame life from the divine perspective. And in one sense, that's what Joseph is doing here. He's telling Joseph that God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. And then in uh, Genesis 41, 32, he says, as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God and that God will bring it about, that God will quickly bring it about. You see, it is this historical event that Stephen draws from. He draws from this event, focusing on the time of the famine, and he states in Acts 7:11, now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it, and our fathers could find no food. But Stephen, uh, Stephen tells us in Acts 7:12, but when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. Jacob was moved by the hunger pains that God controlled. Understand that. Jacob is not uh, thinking about God causing it. Well, I, I assume that. What I know from Scripture is that God created seven years of prosperity, and then came the seven years of famine. And while, while uh, Jacob and company are up in Canaan, and all of a sudden they're in the second year of the famine, they begin to experience hunger pains, and they know that there's food down in Egypt. And Jacob knows to send his boys down to Egypt to get food. But this begins God moving them geographically. So again, Jacob was moved by the hunger pains that God controlled. And in this way, the Lord moved his people geographically to the place that he wanted. The suffering from the famine was the vehicle that God used to get his people to Egypt in order to fulfill his promise to Abraham. Remember that? Back in Genesis 15, 13, where during the time of the Abrahamic covenant, where God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, whereby they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. And so God creates this situation, and once Jacob and company wind up down in Egypt, then the prophetic clock starts ticking. And then when 400 years have passed, God raises up Moses to be their deliverer. Again, this is all part of God's sovereign plan and the way that he moves in time and space and controls circumstances to bring about his will. When Joseph's brothers visited him the first time, they did not recognize him. And he did not make himself known. But Stephen tells us on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And, jo and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Interesting quote here by John Polhill from his commentary on Acts. He says, what Stephen did emphasize, however, was the seemingly insignificant detail that the brothers made two visits and only recognized Joseph on the second. Why this emphasis? The same would be true of Moses later on in Stephen's speech. His fellow Israelites did not recognize him either on his first visit, uh, but rejected him. And only on his second visit did, visit did they recognize him as the one God had sent to deliver them from Egypt. Charles Ryrie adds, he says, Stephen then passed to Joseph, possibly because Joseph is such a good type of Christ. He was sold because of envy, but God was with him. And there was a famine which pictured Israel's condition at that time. And it was the second time when Joseph was revealed to his brethren, just as it will be at our Lord's second coming, that Israel will recognize him. And you see what's going on here, what Stephen is doing. Now, historically, we know that Jesus was rejected by his people when he came the first time. John 1.11 tells us that he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. However, when Jesus comes to earth a second time, Israel will receive him. Through Zechariah the prophet, God said in Zechariah 12.10, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me 
whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. And John in Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. And Paul tells us, in Romans 11:12, that God has not broken his covenant with Israel, for God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And as he says in Romans 11:25, that though a partial hardening has happened to Israel uh, and, and that they are currently under God's judgment, that there will come a time in the, in, the, in the future after the tribulation that all Israel will be saved. And this, again, according to God's sovereign plan. Now, after Joseph had revealed himself to his brothers, he invited the whole family to come to him, that he might care for them. In Acts 7.14, Stephen tells us, Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And again, this is amazing. Uh, for the one who had been treated with hostility, rejected, and sold into captivity was the very one who became the deliverer of those who mistreated him. That's love. <laughs> That's grace. You see, and when you encounter those difficulties in life, I mean, they can make you bitter or better. I mean, the choice is really up to you. And when you're operating from divine viewpoint, it will make you better. And the sufferings of this life and the difficulties we face only become vehicles to burn away the dross of weak character and to refine the golden qualities that God wants to see in us. And that's why James 1, 2 through 4, uh, uh, 2 through 4 tells us to count it all joy when we encounter various trials and tribulations. Not if, but when. Various trials, poikilois perosmos, poikilois, we get the word for polka dots. It means it comes a variety of shapes and sizes. We can have financial tests, uh, social tests, political tests, health tests, a mind of people tests. That, that, that's where I seem to struggle the most. And yet those very tests, those, ver those various trials uh, become the things again that God uses to develop us. Because at the end of the day, God is more concerned with our Christian character than he is with our creaturely comforts. And when we are concerned with our growth, when we want the character of God developed in us, then we can see those trials as opportunities to grow. We can see them as opportunities to shine. Again, it's how do we frame it? And are we operating from the divine perspective? So again, Joseph becomes their deliverer, and this is love, and this is grace. According to Warren Wearsby, he says, Joseph and Moses have this in common. They were both rejected as deliverers the first time, but were accepted the second time. And John Corson in his commentary on Acts says, During a time of famine, Joseph's brothers went to Egypt for help. They stood before the prime minister of Egypt, not recognizing him to be their own brother. As Joseph began to question them when they appeared before him a second time, they admitted that they had sinned greatly against their brother. Then in that powerful emotional scene, Joseph said, I am Joseph. And it wasn't until the second time that they saw him that Joseph's brothers realized who he was. So too, after going through a time of famine, drought, and tribulation, Israel will finally recognize Jesus in his second coming. And so again here we see this pattern that Stephen is establishing. Now at first, at first glance, what we might say is prima facie, uh, there seems to be a discrepancy between Stephen's record of 75 persons in all and the account by Moses, who told us that there were 66 persons in all. And we must remember that Stephen is recalling from memory here, because he doesn't have his Bible in front of him, right? But he's recalling from memory passages of Scripture from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And so we see some of these issues that on the surface appear to us as a discrepancy. Earl Rodmacher states it this way. He says, Stephen stated that 75 people in all went to Egypt. Genesis 46, 26 indicates that 66 people accompanied Jacob to Egypt, not including Jacob, Joseph, and the two sons of Joseph. Stephen derived the number 75 from the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. The translators apparently added nine wives, uh, Genesis 46, 26 says the number 66 did not include the wives. So it was only nine and not the 12 because the wives of Judah and Simeon had died and Joseph's wife was already in Egypt. 
So the Septuagint translation adds in these other persons that the, uh, that the Hebrew text uh, does not include. Now, Stephen skips ahead in his, mention, in his message and mentions the death of Jacob and the patriarchs, saying in verse 15, And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he, and there he and our fathers died. And then he jumps ahead 400 years, saying, From there they removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abram, Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. And so then he jumps ahead and talks about their leaving Exodus. And again, you, you have to follow the bouncing ball. You have to follow what Stephen is doing, and you have to see how he's skipping across, and he's just lightly touching on certain points of the historical narrative because he's making a case. Uh, it's almost a legal mind at work here, we might say. Now, being removed from Egypt occurred during the time of the Exodus when God was working through Moses to liberate his people from Egyptian bondage. But we seem to have a problem, as Stephen states, that Jacob was buried at Shechem in Acts 7, 16, whereas Moses wrote in Genesis that his sons buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah. So again, this is one of those issues where uh, some people look at and they see a, uh, a discrepancy uh, in, the, in the text. Uh, so again, the Genesis uh, tells us that his sons buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, uh, which was where Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, and where Abram, Abraham himself was buried. After Israel had entered the land under the leadership of Joshua, we're told in Joshua 24, 32, that they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem. So in Acts 7, 16, Stephen reports that Abraham purchased the tomb in Shechem, whereas Moses records that Jacob bought the piece of land for 100 pieces of silver. So the question then arises, who bought the burial place at Shechem? Was it Abraham or was it Jacob? Well, Warren Wearsby gives this good answer. He says the simplest explanation is that Abraham actually purchased both pieces of property and that Jacob later had to purchase the Shechem property again. Abraham moved around quite a bit and it would be very easy for the residents of the land to forget or ignore the transactions he had made. And that's a very, very plausible answer. So in this section, what we see in summary is where Stephen revealed how the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph and mistreated him by selling him into slavery. But God was with Joseph and endowed him with wisdom and favor in the sight of others and over time elevated him to the position of governor of Egypt under Pharaoh. And eventually God created and controlled a famine that moved his people geographically to Egypt in order that they might be saved and cared for by the very one whom they'd rejected. In this way, Joseph becomes a type of Christ who was mistreated and rejected by his people, but will be accepted at his second coming. Now, the continuation of Stephen's message, which Leon will pick up next time, moves into Moses, and it gets a little tricky to kind of follow the line of Stephen's thought through these things. And this becomes part of the challenge for any expositor of the Word of God to try to go back and to try to orient to the time and the culture and the mind of the author as he communicated in the original language to his original audience and to try to find that thread of thought and then to be able to communicate it effectively to others. So to pluck some fruit off the tree of this particular narrative of looking at this account, I thought about some present application, and I was able to pull some stuff from the uh, Joseph narrative. Now, Stephen thought and spoke from a biblical worldview, seeing God at work in the details of people's lives. And he personally saw himself in the historical flow of God's plan and could therefore see himself speaking and acting for God. Likewise, believers today who live in the biblical worldview develop a personal sense of destiny seeing our lives as part of the fabric of God's eternal plan that is being worked out moment by moment in the everyday details of human history. The circumstances of our lives are not accidents, but divine appointments designed by God to grow us spiritually and to advance his eternal plan for his glory and the edification of others. And though Joseph suffered at the hands of jealous brothers, we're told that God was with him. <clears throat> 
As Christians, we too know that God is with us. For God himself has said in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? And though Joseph suffered unjustly for a time in prison, we're told that God rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. God in his sovereignty will on occasion bring a person low in order to humble him, but then later exalt him to a place of honor where he can serve as a trophy of his grace. I recall this happening to me about 30 years ago where in my arrogance, I had turned away from the Lord and I was pursuing a worldly life and God knocked me down in order that I might look up. And of course, Hebrews 12 tells us that he whom the Lord loves, he disciplines like a father, his own son. And God has a way of working in our lives again to humble us, to get us to the point to where we look to him. Though Joseph was mistreated by his brothers later in his life, he interpreted their behavior from the divine perspective, telling his brothers, now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. And Joseph repeated his message a second time saying, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in all the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And later, because he's a man of repetition, I love that about him, he says a third time, it was not you who sent me here, but God. So it was a third time he said, as for you, you meant evil against me. And I love that because he calls it what it is. He says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. As Christians, we are called to renovate our thinking and to learn to operate from the divine perspective. And when we do this, we will experience a paradigm shift that allows us to be able to frame life in a way that gives us a confidence to face difficulties. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And operating from divine viewpoint allows us to rise above the trials and hardships of life and to live by faith and not feelings. And in this way, we can live as God intends and find stability and purpose in the details of life that he controls. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this um, short but very packed portion of Stephen's message that he delivered to a hostile audience standing by himself, but you were with him, Lord, and you were guiding him, guiding his mind and his words, for he was filled with the Spirit on this occasion, and that means that he was under your guidance. And Father, we thank you for this recorded message and that we can take this time to see what was going on and to understand how Stephen was able to frame not only his current situation, but the whole of human history from the divine perspective. Father, we pray that in the days ahead that we will be challenged by these things and that you will so work in our minds in such a way that we too will learn to develop a biblical worldview and to operate from a divine perspective, that we might have that personal sense of destiny that is rooted in our relationship with you and your plan for human history. We pray that we will be challenged by these things. We ask this now in Christ's name. Amen. Any questions?